Mr. Chairman, judges of the Know Your City Oration Contest, ladies and gentlemen. For the subject of my oration, I have selected my dad's company. My father has one of the most important jobs in the city. He's an overhead lineman for the Detroit Edison Company. And while it is true that my dad's job is extremely important, my many, many days of research throughout the various departments of the Detroit Edison Company made me realize that there are other departments that can be considered almost as important as the overhead lines. That ought to get him. The committee goes for that stuff about doing lots of research. Ever since the Edison Company was founded in 1886, it has supplied low-cost electricity for light and power to an ever-growing list of customers. Today, it serves more than 3 million people, supplies 95% of the power needed to run Detroit's great factories. Hi, Dad. Just practicing my speech for the oration contest. Fine. Sounds pretty good. Is it all finished? Three quarters, practically. I've changed it, though. Made it a lot broader in scope. Oh, a lot broader in scope, huh? Well, maybe that's a good thing. Only, I thought your story on electricity of the silent servant wasn't bad. Yes, but nowadays, everybody knows about that. Everybody knows that electricity lights the house, makes the toast, shaves your face, curls your hair, wakes you up keeps you warm, heats the water, cooks the food, runs the radio. Runs the electric train and even warms the baby's bottle. See what I mean, Dad? And that's only part of the list. <laughs> Maybe you're right at that. Of course, I was going to end up with a point of economics. Point of economics? Which is that even if everything in my house is run by what I call a silent servant, electricity, it only costs about 30 cents a day. And for an average home, it only costs 11 and a quarter cents a day. See what I mean about the point of economics? Yes, but if you want to talk economics, why not talk about the real point? Not what electricity costs, but what it saves in work, efficiency, safety, time, and so on. Yeah, that would have been okay. But I've got a better idea, a new one. What's the new idea? It's based on this picture chart here. You be the audience, and I'll try it out on you. Electricity made by the Detroit Edison Company is the product of coal, air, and water. These three elements are brought together in each of the company's four big steam power plants, which are located on the waterfront at Marysville, Connors Creek, Trenton Channel, and Delray. To produce electricity in one year alone, Almost three million tons of carefully selected high volatile coal are brought to the company plants by trains or boats. Then it's transported into the power plant where the coal is crushed and made ready for the giant boilers with their big furnaces. Some of these burn as much as 20 tons an hour. In other words, nearly one pound of coal is burned for every kilowatt hour that's generated. And for every ton of coal that's used, the power plants pump a thousand tons of river water. In fact, the task of condensing the turbine steam requires three times as much water as metropolitan Detroit uses each day. Each of the four power plants is equipped with many big steam turbine generators. These are the machines that actually make the power, the electricity. The amount of electricity generated in the company's four hydropower plants is relatively small, actually less than 1% of the total. Next door to the big power plants are what is known as step-up stations. 
complicated structures of steel with transformers, copper cables, and heavy overhead lines. The purpose is to raise the voltage or pressure of the electricity in order to most efficiently send it along its way over the miles and miles of high tension wires that carry the power to the cities, towns, and villages. Next, the power is delivered to one of the company's 12 big step-down transformer stations. Naturally, the voltage has to be reduced before it can be used in the farms, factories, stores, and homes. So, the big transformers in the step-down stations reduce the voltage and again send the electricity on its way along the overhead lines and, whenever necessary, through the costly underground cable system. Then it goes to one of the neighborhood substations, where the voltage is again reduced. From here, the electricity, at proper voltage, is distributed throughout the community. Naturally, it takes a tremendous amount of special equipment for the Detroit Edison Company to supply electric service to its millions of users. And that leads me right into the next part of my oration. And what do you have in the next part? I found a lot of interesting information on the back of the company's magazines. See, now I want to talk about equipment. For instance, look at this. The company has to stock over 15,000 individual items. These vary from a common pin to a transformer that costs more than a house. See, Dad, there's a lot of good stuff here. Look at this one. There's enough wire in the company overhead lines to go around the equator three times. Boy! And it takes 3,500,000 gallons of insulating oil to fill the company's transformers alone. And look at this one. More than five million trees have to be kept trimmed so they won't damage the overhead lines. And look at this one on the number of lamp bulbs exchanged. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, son. Is all of this the kind of stuff you're going to have in your speech? Sure. I spent a lot of time gathering all this information. I know how many trucks they have. I know how... But this is what I mean. After all this research, it's, it's too bad you didn't see the company. Especially since that's what you said you were going to write about. But this is all about the company. I said Look, I was... son, here's what I'm getting at. The Detroit Edison Company is more, much more than just a big collection of costly power plants, buildings, trucks, transformers, and other electrical equipment. The thing that makes a company, any company, the thing that gives it, well, that gives it character is the people in it. And you didn't say a word about them. For example, you talked about the big coal piles instead of the men who handle all that tonnage. That takes skill. It takes skill to pack all that coal into piles that are never too high and yet getting as much coal as possible into the storage space. If you'd taken the time to talk to those men, you might have found out how important that job is. Those tons of coal have to be properly packed to avoid fires from spontaneous combustion. And while we're talking about skills, while you were in the power plant, you should have watched the men getting ready to start the fires in the big furnaces. Those furnaces are so big, the men get right inside and do the job right. And you have to know your stuff to run those boilers in the power plant. You have to know when to feed in more coal and when to cut it down. You have to have enough steam ready at all times for the turbines. Ready and at the right pressure, too. And did you listen to the hum of those big steam turbines? Probably didn't mean a thing to you. But to the men on duty, it means plenty. After years of experience, they can tell by the hum alone that all's well. Number one and two are turning at full generator speed. Number three is gradually picking up speed, ready to come in on the line with extra power. And how do they know that extra power is needed? Well, remember the central control room in the company's main office? It's quite a setup. On that one big board, you can see the entire high voltage system covering over 7,500 square miles of southeastern Michigan. 
And just by looking at the lights, you can tell what turbines are running in each power plant. You can see the stations, the substations, as well as all the main transmission lines. But here again, it's the men on the job that count. It's the experience and skill of the dispatcher and the men who work with him that makes all this mean something. The best way I know to describe the load dispatcher's job is to say that he has to order the amount of electricity that the customers are going to need. Whenever a customer closes a switch to start production in a factory, turns on a range to start breakfast in a home, that customer is demanding the immediate delivery of electricity. And because Edison electricity can't be stored, must be made the very second it's used, it's the load dispatcher's job to order it for them and have it ready for split-second delivery. And how does he do that? Oh, but wait a minute. I could spend all day talking about the load dispatcher and his job. See, in addition to everything else, he has to watch the weather, the temperature, the date, the holidays, the clouds, and a thousand other things. Because all those things influence the amount of electricity the customers may demand at any given time. Why, the load dispatcher even guards the accuracy of your electric clock there. Now, you said the Edison Company had a reputation for dependable service. Well, it's men like the dispatcher, the people who know their stuff that make that possible. Just by looking at this one book, you can see that there are people with special skills all through the organization. Take the department heads, the managers, the men who actually manage the company. Apart from the skills it takes to operate the business for the investors, <laughs> the people like me and the other stockholders, the managers have to decide on company policies, hire and train the right kind of people, people with personality as well as ability. And according to this book, they have to plan ahead for the future. Be sure that the company's finances, equipment and facilities are big enough to handle all the power needs in the foreseeable future. I guess that takes experience as well as skill. Again, for instance, take the people who do the planning for the construction department. They're mechanical, civil, and electrical engineers. They're artists and architects. They design and plan the company's buildings, power plants, district offices, and lots of other things. There's plenty of skill there. Or take the map making department. We have to have thousands of maps and blueprints showing every street, road, and alley in the system. We have to have up-to-date detailed maps of every foot of overhead and underground line system. And believe me, I know these detailed maps help plenty when it comes to giving dependable service. And how about the men in the meter department? All the meters are tested at regular intervals and, when necessary, repaired. I understand it takes people with the skill of a jeweler to adjust the meters. And every one is checked for accuracy against special instruments certified by the United States Bureau of Standards. And while we're on the subject of skills, the men who trim all those millions of trees you mentioned have it. They're trained in the necessary techniques of forestry. Working under the direction of governmental foresters, they always try to preserve the natural beauty of the trees they trim. You've watched the men on my crew, the hot stick gang. That job takes a little knowing how to. In fact, it takes a good many years training to be a qualified lineman. But a lineman needs more than skill to do his job. After a little practice, the boys learn to handle the live wires with tools that are built into the end of long sticks. But the important thing is the teamwork that you need up there. You cooperate with each other, work as a unit. And what's more, you never get careless, because those are live wires up there.
yeah you'd have found all kinds and types of special skills around the company if you look but as far as i'm concerned i think the thing that counts most with practically all the edison people is their attitude a kind of pride they take in their work i don't know you might even call it spirit but whatever it is you can sure find evidence of it all over the company the folks in the customer service offices have it it's a friendly attitude of helpfulness that well for the lack of a better way of expressing it seems to go beyond the line of duty you certainly can see it with the people in the district offices and it's more than just common courtesy and service you can find a good example of what i mean in the people in the company's farm service department they don't stop with just doing a job of helping the farmer with his electrical problems because the farm service man is more than an advisor he's a friend and often a mighty helpful friend too any of the farm service men i've ever talked to get a real kick out of their jobs being friendly and giving extra service that's what makes a company what it is our lamp and cord exchange is an example of the company's extra service policy and so is the policy of repairing customers electrical appliances i heard that during one month alone the boys repaired nearly 29,000 toasters, kettles, coffee makers, electric flat irons, waffle irons, and even electric clocks. And another example is the home service department, where the advisors hold cooking schools for customers or experiment in preparing well-balanced meals in the company's model kitchen. Whenever the customers ask for them, the home advisors call and make recommendations for better lighting or demonstrate the best methods of operating ranges, ironers, or any other home appliance. That's certainly extra service. And the point is, most of those extra services are provided without extra charge. After all, it's just good business to help customers to get the most out of their electrical equipment. And as far as the emergency services are concerned, it doesn't matter whether it's day or night. The switchboard is open 24 hours a day. Detroit Edison, service department. All the lights are out in my house. I think it's a fuse. May I have the address, please? Nearest Cross Street? And the servicemen are always on call, ready to make emergency repairs or replace fuses as fast as humanly possible. When we say our customers have a minimum of interrupted service, boy, that's what we mean. That's one of the main reasons why line crews are on 24-hour duty, too. Many of our trucks are equipped with shortwave radio, and when we get an emergency call in the case of a sudden power failure, fallen wires, or a pole down, KQB 284 to 47, 14126 Rockdale, Pole broken by motorist. Wires on ground. New pole for replacement on the way. We go into action pronto. Just as I said, son, after all, it's the people who make a company what it is. Oh, sure, a company needs equipment, the best and most efficient there is. 
and also a company needs good operating policy. But it's training, experience and skill, and the spirit of the people that counts. Anyway, all that is what I see as the Detroit Edison Company. Just ordinary folks like me who work there. You see, son, it isn't the fact that the company, or a man for that matter, is big or has a lot of physical possessions that counts. The thing that matters is how well you do your job. Just how you cooperate with everybody else you work with. Just how much you contribute to the enjoyment of living right in your own community. In other words, both a company and a man should always be judged, as I see it, by just how well they stack up as a good citizen. See what I mean, son?